So I'm Maria, I'm the founder and CEO of LifeBit, and basically what we do at LifeBit, we build uh, B2B software that enables people uh, to understand and analyze at scale uh, genetic data, basically. Um, a little bit, so today I'm gonna to be talking to you about how advances in AI and genomics are shaping medicine. And uh, yeah, and then a little bit more about what we're trying to do at LifeBit. So how did the genomic revolution even start? So I don't know if you know this picture, but this is actually the first picture ever of DNA, the famous photo 51, taken by Rosalind Franklin here at King's. And that was already more than 60 years ago. And that is what then led to the discovery of the, uh, of the DNA structure, which in turn then led in the early of 2000, our, us uh, being able to sequence the first ever human genome. Uh, and to do that, it, we required literally an army of people and like US, France and UK coming together in a really big consortium to make that happen. From that we moved very fast to actually huge machines that uh, with minimal human intervention, they could now actually read the human genome. They could sequence not just human genomes, any type of genomes. And from that we moved to here, where we are standing today. This is mean ion for the ones that you are not aware of it. And this is the smallest sequencer that we have. Literally, where you see the blue, uh, the blue place, you put the sample, and then this starts sequencing. And you plug it in on your computer, and all of like, like your sequencing data are synced into your computer, basically. So really cool stuff. So this fast evolution of technology, taking us from 1952 to today, enabled us to generate huge volumes of genetic data, but also uh, created breakthroughs in both uh, research and medicine. And apart from that, it created a, a dramatic drop from billions of dollars that it took us to, uh, that we spent on sequencing the first ever human genome to today uh, having your human genome sequenced for less than $1,000 and soon hitting the, 100, uh, uh, the $100. And as you can understand, the moment we are hitting the $100, not only we're gonna be sequencing everyone's human genomes multiple times, you're gonna be sequencing the genomes of your favorite flowers and dogs and everything, or have real-time uh, uh, real sequencing and sensors everywhere, sequencing the bacteria in, in the air, in the food, in everything. Um, and as a result, uh, we are now generating already more, than, uh, uh, more genetic data than we can actually handle. And it's projected that by 2025, we will be generating more DNA data than actually YouTube and Twitter combined. But let's switch to genomic medicine, right? So what is genomic medicine? We hear it often, but I don't think, I, I think that very few people do understand what it is. So genomic medicine initially starts with genome sequencing, right? And, um, and once you have like analyzed the sample, you have to, taken the genomes, you've done the right experiment, then you take all of that information and you start analyzing it, take those raw data and start reconstructing the genomes, uh, um, start decoding, understanding what are genes, what are no, aren't, and so on and so forth. Then basically, you need to start then understanding which are those associations in your genome, the mutation, that relate to specific phenotypes. And then from those associations, you are trying then to extract insights that can uh, take you from like, here is a mutation in, uh, in that particular gene that can actually cause, that is causing, is most probably causing cancer, and here is some uh, potential drugs that would actually target the pathways of that mutation that, uh, you know, that can actually cure you. And in order to have genomics medicine, in order to have something actionable and intervene in healthcare, we need to be going through all of this cycle. And as you can understand from this, most of the genomic medicine is actually data analysis, nothing more, nothing less really. Uh, which is something very fascinating because you are, for the first time in, uh, in the history of healthcare, you are moving from a symptom-based healthcare to an algorithm-based healthcare rather than data analytics-based healthcare. When it starts becoming more exciting even is this that a lot of people think that human genome controls everything. Actually, we have a second genome. For each cell in your body, you have 10 bacteria cells. And it turns out that the genes expressed by your bacteria that live all across your body regulate much more of what is happening to you 
right? From healthcare to wellness, to your mood, to depression, to what we used to call autoimmune diseases, which are not autoimmune diseases anymore. They're just diseases of your, uh, your microbiome, basically, right? Um, and where it becomes even more exciting, like bringing this to the, the, the frontiers of healthcare, it was recently proven, especially the past year, there has been like multiple publications, the one after the other, Nature, Science, Cell, uh, showing that actually, uh, when it comes to curing cancer, our best chance is with immunotherapies. And it turns out, an immunotherapy, for you that you are not aware, is literally a drug that uh, basically uh, re-engineers your immune system so that your immune system can actually understand the cancer and can start fighting it. That is what we are doing with immunotherapy or immune-oncology drugs. Now, what is very interesting, it turns out that the microbiome is actually a much more regulator of your immune system and of actually the, the treatment response to this than anything else. And here is like a million publications just coming from this year, all saying one thing, that the gut microbiome, so the bacteria that can live literally in your stomach, uh, influence the outcome of the immunotherapy drugs. And that was like shocking for the whole community for the first time, because if I give you any other drug that's a chemical drug, right, it's, it's a small molecule that it's supposed to attack a pathway or, or anything like that, you would expect different levels of efficacy, different level of toxicity, and so on and so forth. But if I'm giving you a drug that is modulating your immune system, and then your immune system is not responding, just, and you have different responses, it just becomes very, very weird. So then the scientists were like going crazy with this, like, which is like, what's happening? Like, why are we getting this, right? Why are we curing some cancer patients and others are just like dying, right? And then they found out that it was actually the gut microbiome that was regulating the immune response and was also harboring uh, basically the, the cancer cells from, uh, from, from, the, from the, the, the response of your immune system. Um, now a lot of what we are doing at LifeBit uh, to, and where, where AI kicks in is that if you know that based on your microbiome, you will have different response to the immunotherapy drugs, then you can actually create a companion diagnostic algorithm that potentially could stratify patients, right, and could predict what the response of a particular uh, therapy would be based on the microbiome and also based on the evolution of that microbiome. So then you can start uh, doing two things. First of all, adjusting that therapy, give more, give less, uh, and uh, basically intervene on your microbiome to make it favorable for that therapy to actually be successful and for you boosting your immune system and everything that has to do with it. So in order to do that, what we are trying to do a live bit, initially we, uh, we created a really big uh, uh, catalog of all possible uh, bacteria sequences out there that have been sequenced so far. Um, and we needed that in order to create a huge pile of data where uh, that reference data that we could actually boost our identification of bacteria. Then we created um, a, a system, we engineered the system that could query that catalog for to do annotation and classification very fast. Uh, and then we now are collaborating with Imperial and we are tapping into a clinical trial of over 200 patients where what we are doing with them is we are taking sample, uh, stool sample, as you can understand, in order to be able, we're doing sequencing to be able to get the microbiome, right? Uh, then we are doing, then we are doing here the profiling uh, and we're doing, we doing identification, so what bacteria do you have in your stomach? Then we're doing functional analysis, which informs you of what exactly these bacteria are doing. And then we are doing pathway analysis. So basically understanding not just what bacteria do you have, what they are doing, but uh, what exactly are they regulating and how. Um, then based on that, we, we feed that into um, quite complicated machine learning algorithms where basically we have control groups and treatment groups basically. And then we, uh, we get all of that information along with the response to the different uh, cancer treatments, and then we train. And hopefully what we're trying to do at the end of everything, as I just explained, to be able to stratify patients and predict the cancer response on that. Uh, so that is what we do. 
And, uh, and the idea of this is to try to get this, as I said, as a companion diagnostic therapy, to, uh, as a companion diagnostic algorithm to immunotherapy treatments in order for, to help uh, clinicians to first of all identify any potential cancer biomarkers that are regulated by your microbiome, then be able to stratify patients and predict response and allow then these clinicians to take it to the next level and intervene on the microbiome itself through supplements, nutrition, uh, and any, even exercise, anything it takes to basically reshape that microbiome, which is the next thing where we want to take that and where we want to train our AI algorithms to be able to predict then what exactly those interventions should be. That's all, folks. Thank you so much.